Hey, thanks for joining us online. My name is Sonia. I'm the Connections Pastor here at Artisan Church. And I want to take this opportunity to invite you to see our fall events calendar. Now, this is a moment where you can go online, you can figure out something to do for everyone in your family in order to get connected. All the way from your kids, your youth, to your adults, we have things for you to do to help you build community. Now, uh, we also value generosity. This is an opportunity for you to practice giving. Now, I love it, Pastor Sam says, as Christians, we want to be known for generosity. So this is your opportunity. You can click on the link below. Thanks for joining us today. But today we're continuing in our Words of Jesus series. And if you've been paying attention, you've probably started to catch just a little undertone of a theme within this series. And that theme being approaching certain scriptures, certain words of Jesus, catchphrases even, if you will, of Jesus that have been misappropriated and misused, where people have claimed that verse and said, this applies to my situation and this is how I want to use this verse. This is what I want this verse to mean to me. And this is how I take it. And really, we know that isolating single verses and manipulating it to mean what you want it to mean is a dangerous approach to Scripture. That, that is not a good hermeneutical process, okay? We need to approach Scripture and say, what is the context? Where does this fit? What is Jesus actually saying? And that's really kind of been an underlying theme is approaching well-known scriptures and saying, yeah, but where does it fit? Where does it sit within the story? And um, today is going to be no different. We're going to approach a text that is very well-known, but the verses before and after are far less known. Um, and we're going to dive into it. But before we do, I have to ask you a question. And this question is going to reverberate through the rest of our day. So I want you to really think about it for a second, okay? Everybody, put... You listening? You listening? Do I have your attention? Hey, everybody, I got your attention. I'm like a school teacher right now. Do I have you? You with me? You with me? You with me? You with me? Come on, it's summer. We've been all over the place. A lot going on. We've been busy. Do you know what you want? Do you know what you want? That doesn't sound like a very spiritual question, Pastor Sam. Like, what do you mean? Like, do I know what I want to eat for lunch today? I'm still deciding. Like, I'm working it out. Do I know what I want for my career? Like, I'm working that out. Do I know what I want for my house one day? Do I know what I want for my family one day? Sure. Do you know what you want? How much do you know about what you want? How much can you articulate it, speak it, say it, share it? Do you actually know what you want? And what's interesting is for me, I find that sometimes when I, the deeper I dive into this question, the less confident I am in the answer. Like sometimes the more I think about it, the less sure I am. And definitely the more options there are, the less sure I am. Like the more options that get presented, I'm like, whoa, hold on. I didn't know that that was on the table. Let me think about it. Let me think about it. One of the early marriage lessons you learn is a huge part of being a spouse is trying to help your spouse figure out what they want. Huge part of marriage. This is a substantial piece of a healthy marriage is learning how to discern what your spouse actually wants. Why? Because humans don't really know what they want. That's why the notebook, if anybody's seen the movie, Ryan Gosling is yelling at Rachel McAdams, what do you want? What do you want? She goes, it's not that simple, right? That's marriage for you. It's not that simple. I don't know what I want. I'm figuring it out. I'm working it out. I'm trying to discern that. I, I used to know what I want, but now I don't. I, I wanted something yesterday, but now I don't want it today. And the more you kind of dive into this, it starts to lose its meaning. It can start to lose its focus. We can start to create a lot of questions and anxiety and stress. And it can start to be something that creates pain in our life. But how many of you know understanding what I like simple desires or cravings is different from trying to discover and discern what could possibly bring true significance to my life? Because what I really want is I want to have a significant life, right? Do you? Do you want to do something significant? And, and for everybody, that answer could look different. Significance is found in different things, but I don't just want to waste my life away. I don't just want to burn through the years doing nothing and having nothing to show for it. There's something in the human nature that wants a legacy, wants to produce something, wants to have something to show for our effort. We want to do something that has some semblance of significance. But the problem is, 
if we can't figure out what we want, we don't know what to ask for. For example, have you ever been stumped by a, at a restaurant and you look at the menu and you're like, too many options, too many options. Cheesecake Factory is an anxiety space for some specific people. You're like, no. Every type of food is on this menu. Like, I can't handle Cheesecake Factory. I want a simpler menu. Come on, that is why Raising Cane's is glorious, right? They've been doing the same thing. How many chicken fingers is the only decision you need to make? That's it. What do you want? It's chicken. That's what we do. Well, what else do you have? We got chicken. Just chicken, fries, and toast. And if you want to feel healthy, have some coleslaw, but I don't think their coleslaw is healthy. There's something about it. I'm like, this does not feel good for me, (laughs) but it's delicious. Too many decisions, right? The problem is if I can't figure out what I want, then I don't know what to ask for. And this in lies creates a problem for many of us around faith because Jesus talks a lot about asking for things. But if I don't know what I want, I don't know what to ask for. And so I can actually get stuck. And there's this tension. The disciples actually felt this and they were imploring Jesus, like teach us how to pray, teach us how to ask, teach us how to discover something deeper and and help us to understand what we want. And Jesus answered them through this story in Luke chapter 11, verse 5. And this is where we're going to go today. Verse 5 through 13. We got a whole section of scripture. You can turn there with me in your Bibles. So then Jesus said to them, he's in a teaching setting. And he says, suppose you have a friend. And you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. Now this situation feels really weird to us in 2023, doesn't it? You're like, I don't get it. I've never knocked on my neighbor's house at midnight going, hey, you got bread? I've never had this situation. Have you ever had this situation? I've never had this situation, right? And the reality is this would have been a normal situation because people would often travel between, excuse me, I ate a bar with almonds in it before preaching. Not a good idea. Babe, do you have some water? (laughs) It got lodged. Woo! All right. We're good. We're good. Uh, So it would have been a normal. Come on, guys, just laugh at me or this is really awkward. Like, if you don't laugh, it's really, really weird. Uh, So I'm human. Isn't that weird? Uh, Pastor gets stuff stuck in his throat, too. That's weird. I was really hungry. Um, So this situation happens. This feels weird to us. But it would have been very normal. If, you, if you've ever been to the Middle East, it's hot, okay? So people would travel at night in this part of the world and because it would cool off. And so they'd travel between villages at night. So it was normal for people to arrive at a village in the middle of the evening uh, and, and begin to ask for, hey, do you have any food or bread? But a lot of people, they would eat all of the food for the day. They, well, they weren't wealthy. So they would eat all the food for the day and then start over the next day and bake fresh bread every single day. And so this friend uh, shows up at at another friend's house. That friend has no bread left over at midnight. So he clearly goes to the wealthier person, the the person in the village who could provide for people. Even there's a little clue. Jesus would add these little clues in. The fact that the man had a bed, if he actually had a real bed, that actually spoke to wealth. And so this man would have had more than just a day's worth of bread. And so this situation would have been very normal to the hearers. That's the point I'm getting at. But the door was already locked. And he goes, don't bother me. The door is already locked. And this is an odd response because not providing bread, if you had it, would have brought disgrace, not just on his house, but on the whole village. And my children and I, we're in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though, Jesus is saying this, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless not selfish, your shameless audacity. He will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Anybody ever heard this verse before? Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. We love, this is a verse we love to appropriate. We love to claim. Oh yeah, just seek, knock, the door will be open. I've had this verse thrown at me in the most unhelpful of ways. 
I'm just being honest. I grew up in church, been around for a while, okay? And it was like if the youth leader had no actual encouragement to say, they'd just be like, ah, knock on the doors and see which one God opens. And I'm like, what does that mean? Which doors? Where are these doors? How big are they? Are they wood doors? Are they metal doors? What are these doors, right? <laughs> like, we just throw these verses out, but what is Jesus talking about here? Because have you had every single door fling wide open that you've pursued? Have you proceed, seen every opportunity happen when you ask for it? Probably not. For you, everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, we talked about this last verse in the How Much More series, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Do you realize that this whole story and each of these verses is building to a conclusion statement. It's building to a punchline. It's building up to this. Ask, seek, knock. The door will be open. If you seek, you'll find. Because God will give good gifts to his children. So he's going to give his presence. He's going to give the Holy Spirit. What Jesus is saying is all those who pursue the presence of God will find him. If you go and you seek and you look and you pursue the presence of God, you will always end up finding him. This is the one thing that you can absolutely guarantee in your life. There's a lot that you can seek. There's a lot that you can pursue. There's a lot of doors you can knock on. But if you go after the presence of God, you're going to find it. But he speaks to a bit of persistence here. There's another analogy and parable that Jesus uses of a persistent widow being persistent for justice in front of a judge who just would, was unrelenting until she got her justice. Jesus describes, if you would be persistent, if you would keep going after it, you could get access to the greatest gift of all, the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, the free gift of his presence moving in your life. What could possibly, what better resource could there be than the presence of God? What could possibly produce more fruit in your life than the presence of God? What could possibly accomplish more in your life than the presence of God? There is nothing better to pursue, and that's what this entire text is about. How aggressive are you at knocking, seeking, and going after the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, and His will for your life? And I think this is important because really what we're understanding is this, this section of Luke 11, it's less about our wants. What do you want? It's less about our wants, and it's more about worship. It's more about Jesus saying, I want you to connect. I want there to be connection. It's actually laying down our wants and putting God's will before it, which opens a door to a passage out of Romans. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8, verse 25 through 28. And by the way, too, uh, as, as you guys find the text and we get it ready up for the screens, we're going we're gonna to really dive into, I'm really excited. Uh, we've got Words of Jesus next week. We'll close out the series. On Labor Day weekend, I think it's September 3rd, is Labor Day Sunday, um, we actually have a guest speaker that I'm really excited about, uh, Pastor Doug Graham. He's currently uh, the interim president at North Central University in downtown Minneapolis. He's a mentor of mine. He's actually spoken into the church a lot, just so much wisdom and life and leadership and just a great man of God. Uh, you're not going to want to miss it. Absolutely phenomenal. That Sunday, September 3rd. And then we're going to launch the Who Is My Neighbor series, followed up by a series in October that's going to be Who Is God? And if you're like, no, Pastor Sam, I've figured God out. I got it all down. I got it all worked out. Um, then you're arrogant and maybe don't come. Uh, but if you're like me and you still have some, you're trying to figure out, man, really, who is God? That is the question we're supposed to ask for the rest of our life, is it not? You know, I'm trying to dive into deeper understanding of who God is. So we're going to dive into, and we'll actually unpackage the Trinity in there. The Trinity is this major doctrine that's really held by every major Christian faith. It's uh, uh, something that almost every denomination has really a lot of agreement on, in fact. And, um, and so we're going to dive into that. We're going to do a lot of teaching in that series. It's going to be really, really helpful. So if you want to know even more about the presence of God and the Holy Spirit, come in October. <laughs> it's going to be good. 
But really, uh, this sets up us up in Romans chapter 8. This whole chapter, if you want something before October, read all of Romans 8. Study this chapter. It's a really helpful text um, around the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, which we know, right, the presence of God has been a part of the creation narrative since Genesis 1. He was hovering over the waters of the deep. The Hebrews called it ruach, which was literally like this breath. It was this wind, like this intangible, because the wind is a great descriptor of God's presence where it's something you feel. It's tangible and it's real, but you can't see it. Anybody ever felt God's presence that way? It's like, man, it's so tangible. It's so real, but I can't feel it. So the Hebrew people described it as ruach, ruach. Come on, say it. It's like a tough word. It's a cool word. But, um, but this is, it's been there all the way through. And, and in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would move on specific people for specific purposes. But then the Holy Spirit at Pentecost came and became available to all. The presence of God took up dwelling and we became the, the, the temple and the Holy Spirit takes up residence in us. And every single one of us today can encounter God's presence. And that's one of the beautiful things about coming into a gathering like this is to encounter his presence. And so the Apostle Paul, when he's writing to the church in Rome, this is post-Pentecost, and he's talking about a Holy Spirit that's already come. When Jesus said it in Luke chapter 11, it would have been a little confusing. Wait, the number one thing I'm supposed to ask for is the presence of God. And actually, there was a lot of Israelites that thought that the Holy Spirit was done moving because it had been a long time since they had a really prominent prophet. It had been a really long time since they'd seen some crazy miracles of the Old Testament. So some of them were like, I, no, no, the presence of God is even done. And here Jesus is introducing, no, 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 I'm on a t- I want you to go after the presence of God. But when we get down to Romans 8, Pentecost has happened. The way has been established. That's what they called the Christian movement was the way. Well before the Mandalorian, it was t- talked about, come on, this is the way, uh, was Christianity. And And so the the way understood that the presence of God was alive and active and moving, that healings and miracles were possible. And um, and here Paul starts to associate the presence of God when it comes to our wants, our desires, and our prayers. Because if we don't know what we want, we don't know what to ask for. So this is how strong the Apostle Paul writes. He says this, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. You may know what you want to pray for. (laughs) <laughs> we can make that list real easy, right? What I want to pray for is like more money. Like what I want to pray for is a car that doesn't break down all the time. What I want to pray for is fill in the blank. That's easy. But to know what you ought to pray for, that's a whole different conversation. That's an entirely different conversation. What do I ought to pray for? And Paul would say, we don't know what we ought to pray for. If you're left to praying on your own, you're probably going to pray for the wrong things. You're probably going to build a life of prayer that's built on really petty desires and wants. But the Spirit himself, the presence of God, intercedes for us through wordless groans. And in Romans 8, this is actually the chapter where he talks about all of creation is groaning for the day when Jesus returns. We are anticipating this day where proximity with with the presence of God is constant and, 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 and right, all full glorification happens. We, we stand before, uh, we, we, you know, eternity gets ushered in. This Jesus comes back, ushers in eternity, right? The word, wordless groans, groaning after it. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. This is good news. This is really good news. The presence of God, the Holy Spirit, is interceding, is understanding, is praying according to God's will. I don't know about you, but I'd love to align more of my prayers with the will of God. I'd love to understand the will of God a little bit more for my life. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. There's another appropriated verse, is it not? We hear that verse thrown around, but it's on the backside of seeking, knocking on the door and pursuing the presence of God. 
and pursuing him first and laying down our wants and our desires and saying, God, I want you to work my life together for good. And you are the only thing that is good. So your will is the only way I find good. So I'm going to lay down my wants and I'm going to take up your will and I'm going to pursue that with all that I have. But we're going to real quick pull a few things from these texts and then we're going to have a bit of an extended time of worship at the end. We did this in the first service as well. And really say, what does it look like to press in to the presence of God in my life? But I love this. I want to dive deeper into the Apostle Paul saying, we do not know what we ought to pray for. I'm going to agree with him, and I'm going to make it a bold statement as well. I'm going to declare it. You don't know what to ask for. You don't know what to ask God for. If we just listen to the desires of our flesh, we're going to ask for the lamest things possible. You're going to ask for something you care about today, but won't care about tomorrow. You're going to ask for things that will not bring true significance into your life. Renee and I, in our, in our life, in our marriage, we have had times where we thought happiness would be brought by something that, that literally all it did was bring anxiety and stress. <laughs> Where when it comes, it all it does is bring this anxiety, this stress. We've processed big decisions constantly where we're going, okay, are we going to go do this? What are we going to do with this? We've processed minor decisions this way. But we've learned over time, we don't know what to ask for. We're not good at knowing what to ask for. The reality is I want to run my desires by the Holy Spirit before I ask God for them. I'm saying, you know, I, I just want to filter this. I don't even know if I should ask for this. I want to be careful what I ask God for. I want to be careful what I waste my time praying for. I want to be careful. I want to actually assess, is what I'm feeling, is what my flesh is screaming for, is that even good for me? Is that helpful? Is that even beneficial? But the reality is that prayers and desires that are sourced by the flesh are sustained by the flesh. But your prayers and desires that are sourced by the Spirit are sustained by the Spirit. You see, if I go and I say, I want this, hey God, you're cool with it? I'm going to not really listen to the answer and I'm going to go make it happen. I have to sustain it now. God didn't ask me to do it. He didn't call me to it. He didn't walk me into it. But because I wanted something, I asked for it and then I got to sustain it there. Renee and I have even processed this decision where, you know, one of our, for us, we, we pastor, this is our full-time occupation is building artisan and come on, but it's 2023, you got to have a side hustle to survive in inflation world, right? And so we, we've done different real estate things on the side and we got one investment property we're going to probably sell here this fall. And for the longest time, we were just dreaming. We we're like, we're going to Airbnb. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. We're going to get someone else to pay for our cabin. We had this great plan. We started drawing up a business model. We started dreaming about it. It just made so much sense who we are, where we're at in this season of life. Let's go for it. Let's go for it. But the whole time, there's been this constant check from the Holy Spirit. We're like, why don't we have peace about this? Why doesn't this feel right? Come on, God. This is what I, this is what I want to ask for. I want to do this. I want to do this. Like, come on. But I bet you God sees something on the other side. He sees the amount of maintenance and the amount of weekends we're having to drive up to the property and go fix things. He's seeing me on that, that mower going, I'm up here mowing a second property. Not only do I have my house to take care of, now I got this second house to take care of. He might see what it might steal from our children because all of a sudden we have less time for them or the stress that it gets added. But let me tell you, we're laying that, that dream down. I, we could strategize. We could even find mentors that would tell us it's a wise financial move for the, our future. And we could do this. But we're going, you know what? I don't even think we're supposed to ask for this. Because guess what? If we push this thing forward through the flesh, we're going to have to sustain it. We're going to have to sustain it. I don't want to do anything that major. I don't want to do anything like that that I have to sustain. I want... God to sustain the dreams in my heart. I want him to lead me into those things. I don't know what to ask for. I got new ideas all the time. But I want to test all of those things. All of my desires, I want to run by the Holy Spirit before I even ask for them. Is this even right? Is this even good for me? The next thing is we must seek his will before our wants. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Question for you, church. Do you trust God's will? Do you trust God's will enough to put it before your wants? Do we actually go, you know what, if I discover this, the will of God for my life is not something I necessarily want, am I willing to lay that down? 
Am I willing to lay that down? Am I willing to walk that out? Am I willing to do that? There's times where I know I want, God, I want your will over my wants. When we submit our desires to his will, our prayers get powerful, church. They get powerful because we get into alignment and we start praying according to his will will. As we're transformed by the renewing of our mind, we start to pray differently. Did you know that actually when we walk in step with his will, God can change your desires. He can change your wants <laughs> so easily. Want to know why I know that? Because you want something totally different than you did last year. <laughs> your desires and your wants are always changing. My cravings aren't even the same. I can't eat the same. I don't live on a diet of Eggos and Jack's Pizza anymore and Arnold Ulmer Palmer. Like, that's not my diet. When I was 18, that's all I ate. That's it. That was all that was in my kitchen. But I don't live on that diet anymore. Why? Because it's my body's changed. My desires have changed. My cravings have changed. You're shifting. You're changing all the time. Why not give that to God? Why not give that to God? Say, God, I'm going to give that to you. And really... Um, as we look at your life, we're trying to align with the person of the Holy Spirit. And just a reminder, if, if your wants and the things you're asking for feel really dark, really stressful, full of anxiety, can I remind us that one of the clear-cut ways to know if the Holy Spirit is leading it is, is there light? Does it feel light? Jesus' way is one that we can walk freely and lightly in. And does it feel light? Does it, do, do, does it feel heavy? Does it feel dark? Does it feel intense? Is there clarity of vision? Can I see where I'm going? Can I see where this is leading? Usually for me, when I try to do things in my own strength, when I try to figure out my wants and desires and I forego God's will for my will, I just, I get really tired and crabby and intense and anxious and stressed and darkness kind of, comes around me and clouds my judgment. And it's one of the biggest tells, I don't think I'm walking in step with the Spirit right now. I don't think I'm following His leading right now. Because there's no peace in my heart. Another filter for me too is, is this, so do I know what I want? If I know what I want, I know what to ask for. By the time I get to what I'm asking for, is my ask selfish in nature? Is this really, really selfish? I've found that the Holy Spirit, when I follow the prompts and the desires of the Holy Spirit, it, it, it's always selfless in nature. There's always other people included. One of the greatest tells, if I'm listening to the presence of God, if I'm doing it my way, is, is it all about me? Am I selfish in this? Is my want bigger than my desire for God's will? Am I putting my want before God's will? I got a nice little pastoral alliteration for you it's just to make it sticky, make it memorable. But when we align our wants with his will, that's where we find our way. When we actually say, I'm going to lay down, I'm going to proactively, before I even ask, I'm going to come into your presence first. I'm going to come into your presence first. I'm going to lay down my wants. I'm going to take up your will. And out of your will, I'm going to see the things that I can desire, the things I can go after. You want to know why this is so important as the band comes, up, comes on up? It's not so important so that you ask for less. No. It's not really important so that you just have this small, little, tiny existence. So you just slide off into anonymity and just hide in a corner of Christian faith and I just, I can't listen to my wants so I'm just here in the corner. No, your wants are so misleading. They're so here and now. Your flesh is so misleading. Your flesh is so um, driven by what's happening right now. It's so driven by the immediate that if you listen to your wants before getting in alignment with God's will, your prayers are going to be so small. You are going to pray small, weak prayers because you're going to think according to your flesh. Remember, if I birth it in the flesh, I have to sustain it in the flesh. So if I have to sustain it in the flesh, I'm only going to pray according to what I can sustain. But I believe that if we align our wants with his will, we can get ready for audacious, 
audacious. Yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. There's something about people that get some shameless audacity to say, God, I want dreams that are bigger than me. God, I want prayers that are bigger than me. God, I want a vision that I can't fund. God, I want something so big in my heart. I want to be called to something that I'm not capable of. I want to be called to something that's greater than me. I want to have shameless audacity. But in order for that kind of spirit to rise up, you need his spirit. Your spirit can't do it. Your flesh can't do it. You need the presence of God to get the shameless audacity to knock on some doors to get the shameless audacity to seek some things and find some things, to actually see your life get some deeper meaning. Audacity. When was the last time you prayed an audacious prayer? You see, when we get caught up in the here and now in the flesh, you're praying because you're like, God, I need breakthrough for $200. And he's like, I want you to steward $200,000 for my kingdom. But you're stuck thinking so small. You're stuck thinking in the here and now. We're praying prayers of barely making it. God, if I could just get through today. And he's like, I want you to get vision for tomorrow. I want you to actually get fired up about what's coming tomorrow. What's possible tomorrow. The devil is lying to you to base your life on your basic wants and desires. But you don't know what to ask for because you don't actually know what you ought to pray because you don't know what you ought to want. I'm done with my low-level wants. I'm so sick of low-level desires that make me waste time, waste resources, think small, burn my energy, hurt the people around me. No, I want audacious bold, faith-filled, God-honoring desires to rise up inside of me. But in order to do that, I need to start going after the presence of God first. Before I ask for anything, I just want to seek His face. Before I make a list of my desires, I just want you. What do you want? This is a question I asked at the beginning. Hopefully, if you've been listening, what you want is the Holy Spirit. What you want is more of His presence. What you want is more of His Spirit bonding with your spirit, raising your beliefs, raising the level of your faith, raising up your prayer life, getting some audacious, bold faith. When we come from from that place, anything's possible, church. But we got to go after His presence, and we're going to do that right now. Again, Luke 11, it's more about worship than wants. So would you connect to him? Would you lay down all of those things and just say, I want more of you? Would you just pour your spirit out? Stand your feet all across this place. Come on, what do you begin to ask for his presence?